بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته This is Imam Zay Shakir and I'm here on behalf of the National Zakat Foundation an institution of increasing significance here in the Western world amongst Muslim communities Today we'd like to talk about a very pertinent issue that is vexing a lot of Muslims in the West and that is, can you send your zakat to faraway lands? Is it appropriate to send your zakat to faraway lands? To begin this uh, discussion, we'd like to con contextualize it by referring back to the incident where the Prophet وسلم, sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen. And amongst the instruction that he gave him, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, radiallahu an, he said to him, qal, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa alimhum anna fi amwalihim sadaqatan tu'khadu min agniyaihim wa turaddu ala fuqaraihim. So he says, inform them that in their wealth there is a portion that is to be taken from their wealthy people and given distributed amongst their poor people. So in this hadith, the people in question are the people, people of Yemen that Mu'adh is being sent to. And the instruction of the Prophet وسلم, to Mu'adh is that this wealth should be taken to khadu, or this, this charity, this portion of wealth, which is referred to here as sadaqa, referring to the zakat, it should be taken from their wealthy people and it should be spent upon their poor people. So it should be taken from the wealthy people of Yemen and it should be spent on the poor people of Yemen. So this informs us that this charity is a local phenomenon that is taken from the people of Yemen who are wealthy and distributed amongst the people of Yemen who are poor. So from this, many of our scholars and other evidences deduce that the majority, that the zakat should be distributed and dispensed in the area that it's taken from. This is the asal, if you will. This is the basic ruling. And there's a lot of wisdom in that. Uh, one of the wisdoms is that the poor people in many instances uh, from, for circumstances beyond their control are denied access to the economic wealth of that region. So those who have been granted access by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not necessarily because of anything they've done. They might say, well, I work hard, I went to school, I got three degrees, I deserve to be rich. No, Allah Ta'ala blessed you with the wherewithal to go to school. Allah blessed you with the intellect and the wherewithal to get your, and the circumstance. A lot of intelligent people don't have three degrees. Allah blessed you with the circumstances to get your three degrees. And Allah blessed you with the circumstances to translate that into wealth or riches. So we should always be cognizant of the fact that the opportunities we have either wittingly or unwittingly, with our participation or without any connivance or direct participation on our part, are opportunities denied to those who find themselves in poverty. So it's only fitting that that wealth, the surplus wealth, should be given back to those who've been denied for one reason or another, those opportunities to be adequately wealthy themselves. So there, there's great wisdom in that. Allah Ta'ala reminds us in the Qur'an, وَآتُوهُمْ مِنْ مَالِ اللَّهِ الَّذِي آتَاكُمْ Give them from the wealth of Allah which He has given you. So if Allah has given us wealth in a certain area, that wealth has been denied others. And this is, from the, this is one aspect that makes the zakat so beautiful, that those who have been denied 
by a wisdom Allah Ta'ala knows best and Allah Ta'ala possesses, now by the commandment of Allah, they're being provided for through the surplus wealth of those who actually have zakat. So that is the basic principle that many of the scholars work with. Now there are extenuating circumstances that allow us to spend the wealth in other lands. Number one, and this is a principle many of the early Khulafa al-Rashidin implemented, if once the eligible recipients in a, per, a particular area have been exhausted and there's still zakat, the practice of the early khulafa was to spend that zakat in lands further and further away. So they didn't immediately go to the farthest land, but they went to the adjacent land. And if after meeting the needs of the people in the adjacent lands, once that was done and there was still a surplus, then it was spent to the lands adjacent to those lands and so on and so forth. So one worked out from the area the zakat was collected, where the wealth was accumulated, one works out further and further and further and further uh, out. Another cir uh, circumstance that uh, many of the scholars acknowledge is that in the case of emergencies and calamities, so for example, now, as I film, possibly not when you're viewing, hopefully not when you're viewing, but right now there's a crisis in Gaza. There's an ongoing crisis in Syria and Iraq. And so there are people who are victims of calamities. Uh, they're not normal circumstances. To meet the needs of those people who are victims of these calamities, one can choose to spend their wealth to meet the needs of the people who are victimized by those calamities. So this is a circumstance that the scholars uh, also acknowledge. So there are, there are extenuating circumstances that allow us to spend our wealth outside the area where it's collected. But the, the original ruling is with the Jumhur, the Han Hanabila, the Hanbalis, the Shafis and Malikis is that it should be spent and dispersed where it's gathered Abu Hanifa had the opinion that it could be sent to outlying uh, lands uh, in opposition to the, uh, the opinion of the other three schools in the Sunni realm. So there are extenuating, extenuating circumstances and we should acknowledge and account for those. Another situation that some of the scholars acknowledge is that if people have relatives outside of those who are their immediate dependents in faraway lands that they might spend their wealth to take, uh, meet the needs of those relatives in faraway lands. So extending the principle, charity begins at home, so physically but also those who have some blood connection outside of the immediate realm of dependents that some scholars say are ineligible and they're directly spent on of course from the wealth that one might possess. So there are extenuating circumstances. Here in the West, we're torn sometimes. Should we uh, work with the original principle, which makes a lot of sense and is quite logical? Should we consider these extenuating circumstances? Uh, the best of affairs are the balanced or middle positions. So I think it's wise for Muslims here in the West to make absolutely sure that a portion of our zakat, maybe the, the majority, maybe two-thirds, or definitely half, should be spent here for the needs of our local communities. We have tremendous needs. Amongst those needs are, there are poor Muslims who are struggling, and, and as the economic, economic situation continues, to deteriorate here in the uh, European Union, the United States, and other lands, the needs will only grow and expand. There are also needs of, for example, women who've been uh, abused or abandoned by their husbands. In many instances, this is a problem we don't like to talk uh, about in our Muslim communities, but it's very real. In a lot of instances, these women are forced to uh, face very humiliating cir circumstances in going to shelters for abandoned or abused women 
that are run by members of other faith traditions. And I know personally, uh, working with some of these uh, organizations in the United States, that the Muslim women are told, you know, you're, because you're Muslim, this happened to you. And you can't, if you come here, we don't want you praying. Or similar, uh, very humiliating circumstances. Muslims should be able, we should uh, be in a situation to use the zakat money to assist these women. And there are, there, are, there are caveats associated with that we don't want to go into great detail about in terms of establishing institutions such as women's shelters with zakat money. Uh, the, many of the scholars say in this case, those women who are eligible have to give permission to establish such an institution. Otherwise, being eligible, the money would go directly to them. So unless they give the permission for that money to be used to establish those institutions, those institutions have to be established based on other money. But again, we don't want to go too deeply into these details, just the, ge the general need that's there. The need for so many services in our community uh, that if we don't do it as Muslims, the members of our community will seek help elsewhere. And in seeking help, uh, help elsewhere, they're subject to being swayed in terms of their faith. They're subject to being humiliated because of their circumstances. And a Muslim, وَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ That Allah has uh, authority and dignity, as does His Messenger, as do the believers. It is the hypocrites who fail to realize that. And speaking of hypocrisy, as we were prepping for this particular session, one of our, uh, one of the support staff here mentioned one of the great scholars of the Indian subcontinent made the point, a very astute point, that, and this comes out off of وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ It's the hypocrites who don't realize it. That nafaqa is the root of both infaq, spending, and zakat is a form of spending, and also the root of hypocrisy, nifaq. So infaq and nifaq. And so when we pay our zakat and we spend voluntarily in sadaqah, our infaq helps to purge our souls of nifaq. And it's interesting that when we talk about the izza, that the believers should have the honor and nobility and dignity that the believers should have, who doesn't realize that? So who would argue against that? Who would work against that? The munafiqeen. وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And how would they work against it? In many instances, by not spending to help dignify the members of our community. So it's an interesting uh, meaning that we can get from that particular verse. So in any case, we should try to balance. And we should make sure that some of our money is spent here to support organizations like the National uh, Zakat Foundation. Spent here meaning here in the Western, these Western lands where there are now significant Muslim populations with very real needs and in some instances very dire needs. So we should always endeavor to, to strike that balance and we should also do what we can to assist our brothers and sisters as we said who are victims of very calamitous situations such as the bombardment of Gaza. So we should try to spend some of our zakat to assist the people there, or in other Syria, or Iraq, or Afghanistan, or who knows, Burma, or who, who knows where the next, uh, there might be typhoons in Bangladesh, as frequently happens, and other calamities. So the ulama say those are extenuating circumstances that legitimately justify sending our zakat, but we should always respect the asl. We should always respect the asl. And going back to the hadith of Mu'ad, is taken from their wealthy and spent on their poor. تُؤْخَذُوا مِنْ أَغْنِيَائِهِمْ وَتُرَدُّوا عَلَى فُقَرَائِهِمْ So we should always respect that. We have wealthy people here. The wealth is from Allah, not them. وَآتُوهُمْ Give them 
Mimalillah from the wealth of Allah Alladhi Atakum that He has given you. So the wealth is from Allah, it's from a particular land. It should be spent to assist the people in that land. We should respect that. But we should also be cognizant of the fact that we're in the global village now, so in a sense. And so those members of our global village who have been disadvantaged in many instances by circumstances, we haven't done enough to alleviate. We haven't done enough to shape the policy of these Western lands so that these invasions and occupations and bombardments don't happen. So in a sense, they have a very real right over us also. We should try to balance that right. But as I said, we should make sure that at least half of our wealth is going right here, not only to alleviate the, the suffering of Muslims here, but also to build up our communities. And this is one thing that the National Zakat Foundation places great emphasis on, and that's building up our communities here in the West. So may Allah Ta'ala bless all of us to do just that. May He bless all of you, bless your families, and may, may we uh, always uh, be placed by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala in situations where we can encourage each other, inspire each other, motivate, and help each other to be just a little bit better uh, Muslim, to be better Muslims, to be better believers, to be better human beings at the end of the day. المؤمن المؤمن كالبنيان يشد بعضه بعضا فشب وشبك بين أصابئه. The believers are like the bricks, individual bricks in a wall. Each one strengthens and supports the next, and he laced his fingers together to demonstrate. May we all be a, a supportive brick, a supporting brick in that wall, providing source a, a source of relief, help, assistance. All our brothers and sisters, and zakat is one of the best ways we can do that. And the National Zakat Foundation is one of the best organizations to help facilitate that. May Allah Ta'ala bless all of you. This is Imam, Imam Zaid Shakir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.